Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. As you well know, after the reform of the liturgy after the Vatican Council, we extended the availability of the Bible, of the scripture in the church. Before it was Gospel of Matthew read all the year, and then seasonal changes. And now we have year A, B, C, year of Matthew, year of Mark, and year of Luke. We do not have the year of John because John is somehow intermingled into this free year, especially for the seasons like this. And today in the Gospel of John, we have these puzzling words spoken by Jesus directly, the Father is greater than I. How to understand it? Especially from the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus' teaching to the disciples on the night before he was crucified. Keep the timeline because it helps to understand. They didn't know what we know, what will happen on Good Friday, what will happen on the Easter Sunday. It is a very significant passage for the revelation of the Holy Spirit and for the doctrine of triune God, this is what we call the Blessed Trinity. You know that when our denomination, they demand that whatever we believe it should be written in the Bible, you can ask them if they believe in the Blessed Trinity. They obviously will say yes, because the foundation of Christianity, the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. You can check if you don't believe me. People would say, oh, the Incarnation or the Eucharist is the central mystery in the Christian faith. And we teach this, I, I'm repeating it again and again, that the source and the summit, so the treasure from which we take the highest worship of God, is the Eucharist. And that's true. But the Catechism says that the central mystery of Christian faith is the mystery of the Trinity. And why? Because it's of who God is in himself. God is the center and he is the most important as the message of Christian faith. The Father and the Son are coming to and make their home with whoever keeps Jesus' word and loves him. That is straight from Jesus. There is this romantic uh, picture from the book of Revelation that Jesus is standing at the door and knocking to us. What's wrong with this? He's on the wrong side of the door. You have to open. You have to invite, even if he's knocking, you have to make this decision to let him in. And this is what he's telling about. The image of the dwelling in a person is an image that would frequently associate with the Holy Spirit. Earlier in the Gospel, John gives this image of the Word who became flesh and dwell among us. The Word is Jesus. You can make this substitute. The Greek there is literary, he tabernacled among us. So when you sometimes hear these strange words in the Catholic vocabulary, it's taken straight directly from the Bible. The tabernacle, which we have in each Catholic church, is a dwelling place of Jesus. And because it's from the Bible, you don't have to think twice, it's only used to the dwelling of Jesus among us. The same imaginary is being used here, not in the exact terminology, but the image of the Father and the Son coming and making their home with the person who believes in Jesus. Open up, invite, rejoice the presence of God. I and my Father will love him and come to him and make our home with him. There's hardly any better promise, any more hopeful and an uplifting message which Jesus could give to us. That the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, they are willing, it's His idea, it's God's idea, to be among us, to enjoy our presence as we should enjoy His presence. By contrast, as Jesus says, anyone who does not keep my word and does not love me, it's obviously not going to be the dwelling place of the Father. And then also these words of Jesus, Jesus says, the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So the Father and the Son are distinct in person, but the message is of the same source. And you can see through the whole gospel that Jesus never demands or instructs us to do something 
what he wouldn't do first. So he listens to his father, he's fulfilling the will of the father, so he's inviting us to just follow in his footsteps. And Jesus is very clear in the Gospel of John that everything that the Son does and says is ultimately from the Father. So this union in the message and the plan of salvation is very much obvious in the Gospel. Next, Jesus begins to talk about the fact that he is going to depart from the disciples. And they were not happy about the message that they will be left without Jesus on earth. He's referring to his passion, death, and then to his resurrection, and also following his glorious ascension. Jesus says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, is going to teach you everything. Once more, this is the the words, instructions of the Last Supper before it happened to make it no later. The notion of the Holy Spirit of God is a Jewish and biblical concept. You can go from the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis when the Spirit of God is hovering over the creation. We don't go there because this could be a separate topic. The Holy Spirit was already mentioned in the accounts of Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. When John the Baptist announced you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire. And this was happening from the day of Pentecost. Jesus adds a title to the Holy Spirit. You don't find it anywhere in the Old Testament or before in the ministry of Jesus. It's just straight from the Last Supper. Just put yourself in the shoes of the apostles how much they had to chew, digest on the Last Supper. Body, blood, soul and divinity of Jesus, the very first time, now the Blessed Trinity announced on the Last Supper. That was quite intense teaching on this night. He refers to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. So there are different translations of this Greek word parakletos. The most common translations of this title of the Holy Spirit are the counselor or the advocate. In his letter, John uses the word paraclete not to the Holy Spirit, but he refers it to Jesus Christ himself just that you see the whole message of the Bible. He wrote, My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate in Greek, parakletos, with the Father Jesus Christ. So just see how it is meant from the sight of God. The word advocate is actually from the Latin, directly from advocatus. Ad means uh, to, vocatus is to call, and a paraclete is somebody you call to your side, like in a legal setting. And the Holy Spirit's role is to come to the defense of the flock of Christ, to the defense of the church. You get a very clear message, God is never ever accusing us. That's the part of the evil spirit. God is always excusing us. God is always coming to our defense that we persevere in honoring God, in living our uh, dignity. So the same Greek word could be translated as teacher or comforter. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to teach you everything. And let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So both teaching and comforting. And he is going to comfort you in the midst of trials and tribulations. Look, there is never promised easy life. It's total illusion if people are going in this direction. There will be trials. We have to carry our cross. But in these trials and tribulations, we have very solid support. The support of the Holy Spirit. It was promised just before Jesus went to his own suffering, his passion on the cross. So what does the paraclete mean? People very often would ask because there is a confusion. So the question would be, Does it mean advocate? Does it mean counselor? Or does it mean teacher? Or or does it mean a comforter? The answer is yes, all of them. (laughs) That's why we are using very often the one word paraclete, because if you take one of the translation, uh, you are cutting the others. It's very rich a word. Uh, It doesn't exist in English and many other uh, languages. That's why quite universal in the church is this uh, word paraclete referring uh, to the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus is the first paraclete. He is our first advocate, counselor, teacher and comforter, as it was evident through the whole public ministry of Jesus. And actually the Father is going to send another advocate, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, to be with the disciples. You know, the Holy Scripture becomes really fascinating, interesting, when you pay attention to these tiny details. Jesus said it very clearly, another advocate. So it's not John who discovered Jesus as advocate. Jesus was the advocate, the first paraclete, and another paraclete will be sent after Jesus is gone. So this is significant that at the Last Supper, for the very first time, Jesus reveals the mystery of the Trinity. The Father and the Son were mentioned before, but in one discourse on the Last Supper, Jesus reveals the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit the paraclete. So we do not have the word Trinity in the Bible, but we have the very clear revelation not on the Pentecost day, on the Last Supper about the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. During the Mass in the liturgy of the Eucharist, a part of Jesus' word of the institution, there are other words of Jesus taken directly from the Last Supper, directly from the teaching of Jesus. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. That's why we have it in every celebration of the Mass. It doesn't matter on weekend or weekdays, it's there. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is also coming. It's not only the gift of the Jesus body and blood in the Eucharist, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit. Of course, when we had for over a millennium Latin Mass, people stopped understanding language, so they were using bells, wake up, pay attention, open the door for God. Or you can take it as an announcement. I remember as a little boy there were much more bells than, than we use today. The important was when the priest is stretching out his hands over the bread and wine, that's the invocation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming to the altar. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, this consecration is possible to achieve. When the priest calls the Spirit, who called its prayer epiclesis, upon bread and wine to be changed into the body and blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit is coming into our midst. And that's why is this bell, wake up. Be aware that the Blessed Trinity is acting directly. It is not just Christ coming among us. The Mass is a Trinitarian event. The whole Blessed Trinity is engaged. The Father is sending the Son, and the Father in the name of Son is sending the Holy Spirit. There are distinctions between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they always act together in the divine economy of salvation. This word economy, or economy coming straight from Greek, it was used millennia before we started to use it in the business language. The divine providence, the divine operation to bring us salvation. And if you are somehow wondering, we change the bells for this gong during the institution after the consecration. The really one reason for it was that the bells were making feedback, some strange sound, whatever was with frequencies coming and we don't have this. But in some way, I see it very providential because our gong is very similar to the doorbell. Open up, open the doors of your heart to Jesus. It's a very powerful reminder that you do what you should do every Mass, if the bells are there or not. There are very controversial statements of Jesus in today's reading that make faithful Catholics kind of scratch their heads. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. And they didn't rejoice. They didn't really believe Jesus, that it's good for them that Jesus is living. And even a more puzzling words of Jesus, for the Father is greater than I. It's straight from the mouth of Jesus. And on this one sentence, there were big heresies, big false teachings in the church, tearing apart the church. Have you ever wondered about this? Isn't Jesus fully divine? God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial with the Father as we are professing every Sunday in the church? None of the Gospels seems to reveal more clearly the mystery of Jesus' divine identity than the Gospel of John. If you would like to make some title of the Gospels, you can do it to any of the Gospels, like Matthew would say, Behold your King, 
but John's gospel would be behold your God. I mean, there is no even discussion about this title because it's so obvious from the whole message from his gospel. So what do we say as Catholics today? Because it's in the same gospel, the Father is greater than I. We don't preach about it. Do we just pretend like it is not there? That's wrong choice. That's not what we should do. The question becomes not what do we do with these verses, but what do they mean? How do we understand these verses in context of the whole gospel? It must be consistent as we insist on the whole teaching. So the Gospel of John begins by saying the Word was with God and the Word was God. And people sometimes are confused that the secret or does to get it more um, acceptable, you can change the Word, which means for Jesus, you can put the word Jesus there and then it makes perfect sense. Jesus was with God and Jesus was God from the very beginning of the Gospel. And then in the same Gospel, the Father is greater than I. If you flip the Gospel of John to the end, after the resurrection, doubtful Thomas says, my Lord and my God. We do not know if Thomas actually touched Jesus, but he believed. And he surely couldn't touch the Godhead of Jesus. Maybe he was able to touch the risen body of Jesus, but not the Godhead. He had to believe it. And what was the reaction of Jesus? Jesus didn't respond, oh, oh, Thomas, (laughs) you've got it all wrong here. I'm just a man? He didn't say like this. Jesus accepted the worship due to God alone that Thomas gives him in John 20. So in John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So how the audience reacted. The Jews picked up stones and they are going to kill Jesus because, as they said on the trial, he also a man is making himself God. So they understood the message absolutely perfectly. So the question became, what does Jesus mean in this verse by saying, the Father is greater than I? In the Gospel of John, Jesus isn't just fully God, he's also fully human. Once more, the timeline before crucifixion, before the resurrection. In his Last Supper discourse, Jesus is focusing on his humanity that will be crucified, die, then will be raised and eventually ascend to the Father. In the great mystery of the ascension, something unprecedented will take place. That finite and limited human body is going to be glorified and enter into the life of the Blessed Trinity. Of course, it was this transfigured body, the risen body of Jesus, But it never happened before God loves us that much that he invited human nature to his interior life of the Blessed Trinity. The Father, Son and Spirit are all pure spirits. There are no bodies in material. They don't have limitations of space and time what we have through our material and spiritual structure. John says at the beginning of the Gospel that the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus, assumed a finite, limited human nature through the Incarnation, through the Annunciation to Mother Mary. This means Jesus has not only a body, but also a human soul, a human mind, human will, everything that there is about being human except for sin. Just by definition, Jesus in his human form has been limited less than the Father. As Jesus is speaking about this human nature, his human body, he's less than the Father. It's it's obvious from this angle. And Jesus is not saying that the Father is greater than him with reference to his divine nature. The Father is greater than Jesus with reference to his human nature, which is the focus of these words. Whatever he will say, it's a mystery. And we are trying to put it in words, make it reasonable, but we do not have the full insight into the mystery of God. But Jesus is telling his disciples, if you understand and accept this mystery, you should rejoice. 
we know that they didn't accept, they didn't believe Jesus. They needed all this experience of passion, resurrection, and the 40 days of teaching after the resurrection that they would get it. Before the ascension of Jesus, there was no human being, no human nature that had been brought into the life of the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's greater than the living, visible presence of Jesus among us. And the Acts of Apostles are absolutely clear. When Jesus disappeared from the sight of the apostles and the angels sent them back to Jerusalem, they returned to Jerusalem rejoicing. They got it. Human nature was invited into the internal life of God. So my human body will die and it will be raised again. And then I will return to the Father. This applies to Jesus from the Last Supper and this applies to each one of us as the disciples of Jesus. So I want to make sure that you are clear in your minds. This isn't just my interpretation or Dr. Petrie's interpretation. This is the ancient answering of the question which was already clarified over 1600 years ago. This text has been interpreted by great saints and doctors of the church. Doctor of the church is a teacher of faith, so you can rely on their good teaching. St. Augustine, in his book on the Holy Trinity, then over 1600 years ago, he clarified it completely. It's from his writing. They, the heretics, those who teach false teaching, say, for instance, that the Son is less than the Father because it is written that the Lord himself said, my father is greater than I. This was the main heresy of Arianism. So, not without cause, the scripture says both, that the son is equal to the father, and that the father is greater than the son. For there is no confusion when the former is understood as on account of the form of God, and the latter as an account of the form of a servant. This is 1,600 years ago. In truth, this rule for clearing the question through all the sacred scripture is set forth in a one chapter of an epistle of the Apostle Paul, the letter to the Philippians, where this distinction is commanded to us plainly enough. For he, the St. Paul, says, who, being in the form of God, fought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and was found in fashion as a man. So the Son of God then is equal to God, the Father, in nature, but less in fashion as a human being. For in the form of a servant which he took, he is less than the Father. But in the form of God, in which he also was before he took the form of a servant, he is equal to the Father. So it's amazing mystery. The mystery of the Incarnation is that both of those realities are true in the one person of Jesus Christ. And that's why the celebration of Ascension is moved to Sunday, that we participate. Sometimes people are confused if somebody dies and they cannot find their own peace reconciled with the loss of their parents, spouses, children. Something of me died. Yeah, that's the one side of the coin. What is the other side? Something of me was born to the eternal life. This is what happened with the announcement of Jesus and then on the Ascension Day. You can just say thank you. You can just rejoice that something of you has been brought into the life of the triune God. Why panic with pandemic? Why fear? If God loves us so much that he invited the human nature into the interior life of the Blessed Trinity, why to worry? God is obviously on our side.